So Jesus said to those who had come to believe in him, If you remain in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. But they answered, We are the descendants of Abraham. We have never been slaves to anyone. So how can you say we will become free? You see, they answered Jesus in the same way we might. I mean, we're Americans, right? We live in the land of the free. We sing songs about it. We get together and have parties and fireworks, all to celebrate our nation's freedom. But Jesus was speaking of a different kind of freedom, a freedom that can only be found in him. He answered them, this is the truth. Everyone who chooses a life of sin isn't free. They are a slave to sin. A slave has no permanent place in the family, but a son or a daughter, they belong forever. So if the sun sets you free, you will be free indeed. Are you free? What does that mean? This, this day we, we set aside, rightly so, to celebrate the freedom that we have in our great nation to gather, to worship. But what does it mean to be free in Christ? It's more than anything that any political entity can grant to us, and it's also more than anything any political, political entity can take from us. Are you free? What I see in the passage that you just saw in that video in John chapter 8 is that there's sort of two errors that we can fall into. One is thinking that we're not enslaved, that we don't need rescue, that we are right now free. The other one is thinking that we can't be set free, that there's no way we can be rescued from the slavery that we experience in this world. Both are an error, and Jesus is the answer. Do you remember how Jesus began his earthly ministry in Luke chapter 4? He, he goes into the temple, and he reads a passage from Isaiah. And he says, today this has happened. But let me read that passage to you, and I want you to pay attention to what Jesus says happens at the inauguration of his public ministry. So this is Luke chapter 4, verse 18. Jesus reads, The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set free the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Do you see what it says there? It says he's come to set free the oppressed, to proclaim release to the captives. But the question I want to answer today is what is it that Jesus came to set us free from? Who is that oppressor he came to rescue us from? Because you see, after Jesus earthly ministry, uh, the people were still enslaved to Rome. Many Christians lost their life for their faith. Many of them were constantly oppressed. So, so what does Jesus mean when he finishes and says, today this is fulfilled in your hearing? What did he come to set us free from? What kind of freedom do we experience in Christ? Well, what you need to understand is that the, the world lies under the dominion of the evil one. That ever since sin came into the world, he has had a power. But it's a power that was broken at the cross. And that's why Jesus explains in John chapter 8 that whom the Lord sets free they are free indeed. They are really, really free. Let's look at the passage beginning in verse 31. It says, Then Jesus said to the Jews who had believed him. 
I want to pause there after that, that first introductory sentence right there. I want you to think about this for a second. Jesus is talking to a group of Jews who have believed in him. You might remember John 8 is where Jesus announces that he is the light of the world. He has announced that he's the son of man, that he's come from the father, and he always does his father's will. And it says at the end, in verse 30, it says, many believed in him. Now he's specifically addressing the people who have heard his words and believed what he has said is true. That's who Jesus is talking to right here. And that's why the following dialogue is surprising. Let me go on. If you continue in my word, you really are my disciples. You will know the truth and the truth will set you free. We are the descendants of Abraham, they answered him, and we have never been enslaved to anyone. How can you say you will become free? Jesus responded, truly I tell you, everyone who commits sin is a slave of sin. A slave does not remain in the household forever, but a son does remain forever. So if the son sets you free, you really will be free. I know you are descendants of Abraham, but you are trying to kill me because my word has no place among you. Did you remember what it said in verse 31? He's talking to people who have believed in him. And by the time we get to verse 37, they want to kill him. You could say that things escalated quickly. So so how do they go from that? How do they go from they've heard him, they believe what he says to we want to kill him? How does that shift happen? Well, Well, here's what I need you to get first and foremost, is that when we read through the gospel of John and it uses the word belief. It's not always talking about saving faith. I think that James makes it a little more clear when he explains that there's two different kinds of faith. There's saving faith. You remember in James, he says that kind of faith is vibrant. It's alive and it produces works. But he also talks about another kind of faith that he refers to as demonic faith. You remember that? He says, you believe that God is one, you do well. The demons also believe and tremble. That kind of faith does not save the demons. Simply knowing truth does not save. It's how you respond to that truth that saves you. And so what Jesus tells them in this passage is that they need rescue that they are enslaved. He's saying, okay, you believe what I'm saying. You think that I'm speaking true. Here's what you need. You need rescue. You're slaves. And how do they respond? They're insulted. How dare you talk to us this way? Do you have any idea who you're speaking to? We are the chosen people. We are descendants of Abraham. They refuse to believe that they could need rescue. And what Jesus is letting them know is that what they need can only be found in him. What I see in John 8, 31 through 38 is that true freedom only comes through Jesus. That's what Jesus is telling them. Guys, what you need is what I'm offering and you will not find it anywhere else. You can't get it from anything else. So important to understand this. The true freedom, the freedom that we need can only be granted to us from Jesus Christ. It's not given to us or taken away from us by anyone or anything else. But what I see is oftentimes the freedom that we think that we need is not actually the freedom that we genuinely and truly need. The the freedom that we think that we want is oftentimes not truly the freedom that we need. And what Jesus is letting them know is that he has what they need. He has rescue from lifelong slavery, and it's found in Christ and Christ alone. And what he's going to do is he's going to tell them how to gain that freedom. And so the question I want to ask of this text today is, how do we receive that freedom? True freedom only comes from Christ. Okay, I'm sold. How do I get it? How do I receive that freedom? And we're going to look at the passage 
Uh, we're going to see three ways that Jesus tells us we can receive this freedom. So first one he says is through continuing in his word. Through continuing in his word. He said, okay, you've heard me. You believe what I'm saying is true. Now keep going. Don't stop that. Hold on to that. Abide in that. You know, the reality is oftentimes we believe that if we start well, we don't need to finish well. And I can tell you this as a track coach for 14 years, it doesn't matter how good your start is. It's important. It's really important to come out of those blocks just right. But if you don't finish well, I don't care. Th this, is a, this is a common sight for me. I spend a lot of time staring at the finish line. I've clerked a lot of track and field races. And, and I, I coach at a small high school, and so we had a six-lane track, and I go find six timers, and I would e assign each timer a lane. And their job was to sit there with their timer and to stop it when they saw the runner in their li lane cross that line. And they weren't supposed to look at anything else, okay? They weren't supposed to look out and watch how the runner was running and sort of judge their performance. Let's see how they're doing out there. That's not what they were doing. Their goal was singular. Look at the finish line. And when they cross, push stop. And then tell me what it says. If nobody crossed the line, you know what they did? They didn't push stop. And what I would do on my sheet is I'd write DNF, did not finish. And it didn't matter how close they came to the finish line. One of the things that, that would happen often, especially in the 110 hurdles, We'd have, I'd have athletes, sometimes I'd have athletes leading the race. One time I had this athlete, he was a flight ahead of everybody else, okay? He was a full flight of hurdles ahead of everybody else in the race, and he clipped his toe on the last hurdle and crashed to the ground, and everybody ran past him. And he got up, threw his arms down, and walked off the track. It's not sportsmanlike. But guess what we write on the sheet? Doesn't matter. Well, he led the whole way. He was doing great. He came out of the blocks exactly like he was supposed to. Doesn't matter. Did not finish. It doesn't matter how well you start if you don't continue. You must finish. And so Jesus tells them, continue in my word. Verse 31, Jesus said to the Jews who had believed him, if you continue in my word, you really are my disciple. You will know the truth and the truth will set you free. You see this progression, this progression resulting in freedom begins with continuing in his word and continuing in his word. That word right there, it's also translated abide. You're going to see it used in John 15 when we talk about the vine and the branches. And what do we need to do as branches? We need to abide in the vine. We need to continue in the vine. Why? Because it's that trunk that every branch receives all its sustenance from. Everything that it needs to survive, it receives from that trunk, so it stays in it. Do you remember how Peter responded to Jesus in John chapter 6 when everybody goes away from Jesus? And Jesus says, are you going to go also? He says, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of life. Your words are what is sustaining my life. Is that true of you today? Because that's where freedom starts. When you recognize the words that are coming from Jesus is what sustains the life that he has placed within you. What he's speaking is what you need to live in him. Freedom begins as we determine to continue in the word that we have received from him. But tragically, these here, who it says in verse 31, have believed in him, now reject his word and turn away. And by the time we get to verse 37, he says this, I know that you are the descendants of Abraham, but you are trying to kill me because my word has no place among you. The words that Jesus is saying have no place in them. And this is how people respond. When they don't like the message, they crucify the messenger. If they don't like what's being said, they want to eradicate that from their life. So these people go from believing in Jesus to wanting to murder Jesus. Why? Because his words have no place in them. How do you respond to the words of God? 
Do you receive them as what sustains your soul? Or do you try to explain them away as inconvenient, as not relevant, as, well, surely it's not saying that because that would mean I would need to change my entire life. Surely that's not what God means because then life would be difficult if I lived that way. So it's probably not saying that I'll reject that. Or do you go to it and realize, no, this is the way of life. This is where I'm going to find the sustenance that I need. No matter how much my emotions are telling me this is hard, this is awkward, this is difficult. No, this is it. This is the message I need. And I'm going to continue in this no matter what. When I am convicted that things need to change in my life, I am going to respond by repenting, turning, and receiving my sustenance from God's word instead of doubting the message that he sent to me. But this is not how these people respond. Let's go on to verse 39. They say, our father is Abraham. They replied, if you were Abraham's children, Jesus told them, you would do what Abraham did. But now you are trying to kill me, a man who has told you the truth that I heard from God. Abraham did not do this. You're doing what your father does. We weren't born of sexual immorality, they said. We have one father, God. Did you see what they're doing now? Now they're insulting Jesus. They're saying, well, we know who our father is. That's a low blow. They reveal the disdain they have for Christ. And what's, what's core to their problem is that they believe their freedom comes from their descent. We are descendants of Abraham, so we are de facto free. We're free because we're the chosen people. We don't need you. We don't need rescue. We have what we need because of our descent. And so they refuse to hear his words when he tells them the truth. How do you respond to people who tell you the truth? How do you respond to people who come to you and read God's word to you and say they're concerned about you? How do you respond to that? Do you respond to it as this is life giving, this is soul sustaining, or do you reject it? Look at verse 42. Jesus said to them, if God were your father, you would love me because I came from God and I am here. For I didn't come on my own, but he sent me why don't you understand what I say? Because you cannot listen to my word. Look at the connection there between verse 42 and 43. The conclusion is they can't listen. The reason is because they don't love the Father. The reason they're not receiving the message of Jesus Christ is because they don't love his Father. And so when the Son is standing there in front of them, they don't love the Son. They're not at all like Abraham. Abraham saw Jesus afar off and he ran and he killed the fatted calf. He prepared for him. He loved him with his hospitality. And what do these do? They hate him. And they reveal in their hearts that they hate the father. He says this, truly I tell you, in verse 51, truly I tell you, if anyone keeps my word, he will never see death. You will not get to the place where you listen to his word until you love the Father, which means you need heart transformation. You need to cry out to the Lord, Lord, give me a heart that loves you. Give me a, eyes that see you. I want to know you. You need him to do a supernatural work in your life in order to rescue you from lifelong slavery. What Jesus says is that freedom comes for those who continue in that word, who abide in it. And I think that we're meant to tremble when we read in the word and we realize that I need to keep going, right? There's a crown promise to those who overcome, to those who endure to the end. I can't quit halfway. That's not how it works. If, we, if those who go out from us, what do they reveal? They were never of us. So then I hope that the question that your heart is asking is how do I endure how do I continue in that word? How do I hold on to the message I heard at the start and finish the race without walking away? The answer is in Hebrews 3. Let's turn there if you would. Hebrews 3 verse 12. Hebrews 3 12, the writer of Hebrews says this, watch out brothers and sisters so that there won't be in any of you an evil unbelieving heart that turns away 
from the living God. He says, watch out for evil, unbelieving hearts. Because here's what evil, unbelieving hearts do. They turn away from the living God. And that's what we're seeing right here in John 8. The evil, unbelieving heart of those who believed his word, but do not love his father, are now turning away from him. Well, the passage goes on. How do we not do that? How do we not turn away? How do we stay solid? How do we stay connected to that trunk so I can receive everything that I need for life and godliness? He goes on, he says this, but encourage each other daily while it's still called today so that none of you is hardened by sin's deception. Do you see the solution that the writer of Hebrews gives so we don't get hardened by sin's deception, so we don't have evil, unbelieving hearts, he says, encourage each other. In other words, endurance is a community project. You cannot run this race to the finish line by yourself. And that's his conclusion here in verse 14. For we have become participants in Christ if we hold firmly until the end the reality that we had at the start. How do we avoid being hardened by sin's deception? Because I have this problem, this heart inside of me can get tricked by my emotions, by my desires. And so what God does to help me is he surrounds me with a community who can call me out on my nonsense. Who can say, hey, Pastor Caleb, your life is not conforming to God's word in this area. And I'm telling you that because I love you and I care for you. And I see that you're beginning to be hardened. Your conscience is getting callous as you refuse to conform to God's word in every single area of your life. He says we need to encourage each other daily so that we will not be hardened. I want you to think about that for a minute because that's why we're here. That's why we, we make sure that we stand up for the right that we have in this nation to assemble. It's because we actually need each other. Do you get that? Th that's why a year ago, we stood up and we said, you know what? The Constitution grants us this freedom. Our assembling is too important. We need to be here in person with each other. And it's not because we wanted to have a social gathering. It's not because we needed social interaction. It's because we needed to encourage each other so we would not be hardened with the deception of sin. Do you understand that? Now, now here's the good news. We have that freedom in this country. We, we stood up and we said, you know what? The Constitution guarantees us this freedom. They came in and they gave us citations. We didn't pay those citations because those citations were illegal. And good news I have for you guys today is all those citations now have been canceled. We haven't had to pay a dime of a single one of those. But here's the reality. All of that, all of that standing up, we had to have a lawyer write a letter for us and they backed down. But all of that, the point of it wasn't so we could socialize. The whole point of that, why we while we stood and we said, no, we're not backing down right here. This is one area where we are not going to back down. The reason we did that is because of Hebrews 3.13. And if you're here today and you're excited about your right to assemble and you are not taking up the privilege of encouraging your brothers and sisters so that they're not hardened by the deceitfulness of sin, then you're wasting everything we did. The whole point of us being here every single week together. And he doesn't even say every single week, does he? Do you see what it says? Daily, we need each other. But why is it we're not supposed to forsake the assembling of ourselves together? Because we need to consider one another how to stir each other up to love and good works. Because we need to be so involved in each other's lives that we see when a brother or sister begins to wander off the path and we warn them. So that what? So their heart is not hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. You've been set free. Utilize that freedom to remind your brothers and sisters who they are. Utilize that freedom to hear from your brothers and sisters who you are. Live out of the fullness that you have in Christ. 
this right to assemble is pointless if we're not assembling in the way that God has told us to. And what that means is we consider each other in order to stir each other up. I can't consider every single one of you here. I can't have a conversation with every single one of you here. We all are a body. Every single one of us has a responsibility to have a conversation here this morning that's going to resonate in eternity as we consider each other and we encourage each other so that we are not hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. That freedom that we have came from Jesus and that freedom is maintained as we continue in his word. That endurance is a community project. True freedom only comes from Jesus. He is the only source. He's the only one who can give it. And there is no one and there's no thing here on this earth that can take it away from it. us. But how do we receive that freedom? How do we receive the freedom that Jesus has promised to us. I told you first thing is you need to abide in his word. You need to continue in his word. What his word says is how you live your life. That's what you're basing your life upon. The next thing that I see in the passage, it's through knowing the truth. And you see this right there in verse 32. You will know the truth. And what's going to happen? The truth will set you free. How is it that truth sets me free? You cannot live a free man in the darkness. It doesn't work. All you're doing is pretending like you're experiencing freedom if you don't understand the reality of the world that surrounds you. And until you come to the light of the world, you will not see the reality of the world. Here's your reality. You were created to be a worshiper. Everybody is. Everybody worships something. Observe anybody for any amount of time and you will figure out what they worship by how they spend their time, by what gives them value and meaning, by what they dedicate themselves to. We are all designed to be worshipers. And the truth is the only worship that will bring us lasting significance and satisfaction is worshiping the creator of the universe, worshiping the Lord. Jesus says, the hour is coming and now is when true worshipers will worship me in spirit and in truth. And so Jesus sets us free by revealing to us that we were made to worship and that there's only one who is worthy of that worship. The reality is that truth sets us free to live the lives that we were designed to live. Look at the passage, John 8, 32. You will know the truth and the truth will set you free. But listen to the obstacle in the hearts of the hearers right here. We are descendants of Abraham, they answered him, and we have never been enslaved to anyone. How can you say you will become free? Jesus responded, truly I tell you, Everyone who commits sin is a slave of sin. A slave does not remain in the household forever, but a son does remain forever. This is really confusing, the way the Jews respond here. And there's sort of two schools of thought here on what they're meaning. And really, we can't know exactly what they mean when they say we've never been enslaved to anyone because we can't read their minds. But, but here's what I know. I know that Jesus is not talking here to ignorant people. He's not talking to Jews who do not know their legacy. The education system that was in place when Jesus was teaching was phenomenal. They, they counter-Hellenized the Greeks. And it's pretty amazing when you study education in Jesus' time. The Jews that Jesus spoke to were very educated when it came to their legacy, when it came to scripture, when it came to their own history and their story. And so here's what I know. I know that they know they were slaves in Egypt. I know that they know they were slaves in Babylon. They know those stories. Those are stories that they hear. Those are stories that they remember when they gather. So, so what do they mean when they say they've never been enslaved to anyone? Uh, wh what they are saying here, I believe, is that while maybe they've been in positions where they've been held captive, they've never been under the power or dominion of anyone except themselves. And why is that? Because they are descendants of 
Abraham. Here's the lie. They believe that freedom comes from descent instead of Jesus Christ. They believe because we were born Jews, we are free. And Jesus is letting them know, no, that's, that's not how it works. There's really two errors that people fall into when it comes to freedom. One is, I'm not a slave. I don't need freedom. I don't need rescue. I'm good. Life is good. You ever try to share the gospel with somebody like that? It's really difficult, right? The other side of it is, I am a slave, and there's no rescue for me. There's no way I can be set free from the captivity that rules my heart and mind. Jesus is just not strong enough. Both of those are an error, and both of those Jesus is going to address in this passage. So the first one is, these Jews don't believe that they need to be rescued. And Jesus says, really, do you sin? If you sin, you are a slave of sin. What, what this means is that every single child who is born who comes in this world. If you spend any amount of time with a baby, you'll realize that we do have sin natures. And you'll realize that we have those from birth. Every single one of us comes into this world as a sinner. And because we sin, we are slaves of sin. And what that means is we need rescue. And it's rescue that only Jesus can give. The Jews don't get that. These people who it says have believed in his word don't understand that. Let's continue in verse 44. Jesus says this, You are of your father the devil, and you want to carry out your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he tells a lie, he speaks from his own nature because he is a liar and the father of lies. Yet because I tell you the truth, you do not believe me. Do do you see what Jesus just said to them? They say, we're sons of Abraham. He says, no, you have a different dad. Do you get that? Do you understand what he's letting them know? He's letting them know, you guys, you're not sons of Abraham. You're sons of Satan. And the reason I can tell is because you love lies and you speak lies. And the father of lies, he speaks lies fluent lie. That's his language. If he's speaking, guess what's coming out? Lies. And he's a masterful liar. His lies sound so close to the truth that people are constantly deceived from the beginning of creation. And Jesus says, because you love lies, you reveal your heritage. It's not Abraham. Your father is Satan. The reality is that everybody who's born comes into this world as a slave of sin and a son of Satan. Do you understand that? That's who you were when you were born. That's who you were when you came out of that birth canal. That's why Jesus tells Nicodemus in John 3, the only way for you to have eternal life is if you're born again. Every single person in this room right now is either a son of God or a son of Satan. And everybody today who is a son of God was not born that way. They were transformed. They were rescued. They were moved from that kingdom of darkness to that kingdom of light. And these Jews think that they're born as sons of Abraham, descendants of God. And they do not know that they need rescue. John makes this absolutely clear in his first epistle. Let me read it to you. 1 John 3, verse 8. He says, the one who commits sin is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. The Son of God was revealed for this purpose, to destroy the devil's works. Everyone who has been born of God does not sin because his seed remains in him. He is not able to sin because he has been born of God. This is how God's children and the devil's children become obvious. Whoever does not do what is right is not of God, especially the one who does not love his brother or sister. What what is he talking about? This word right here in verse 8, the one who commits sin, that word translated commits right there, it's making a practice of sin. This is your way. This is your pattern. This is how you live. 
This is your identity. And anybody whose identity is sinner, that's what I do, that's how I live, deal with it. I'm just going to sin against you. Sorry, not sorry. That's the son of Satan. But what does he say? He says the sons of God are revealed how they don't sin. Now you need to read that in the context of the whole book. Because most of you have read chapter 1, I hope. Because in chapter 1, it says, if someone says he has no sin, he is a liar, and the truth is not in him. So he's not talking about sinless perfection right here. What does he mean when he says he's not able to sin? What is that talking about? Well, you should understand it if you're a believer, because think about the last time you, were sin you sinned and you were convicted of it. How did you feel? You realize this is not the food that appetizes this is not what sustains my soul. What I was deceived into thinking would bring me pleasure has only brought me pain. But what it means to be a new creation, it means you are spoiled forever for sin. You will sin, and you will be miserable every time you do it. And until you repent, you will be in anguish. One of the worst places for a human being to be is in sin with no anguish because it reveals they've not been set free. Our freedom is revealed by our inability to any longer continue in sin, to continue practicing it, to stay in it. We can't. We can't live that way any longer. We are designed for a different kingdom, and we are miserable as long as we continue in what God's word says is wrong. This is how we respond. And, and, and think about what I said about the freedom that we experience and enduring that as a community project. I want this to encourage you because if you see your brother or sister walking in sin and you warn them, understand your voice resonates with the spirit within them. You're not telling them something foreign to themselves that they are a believer. You're reminding them of who they are in Christ. Brother, sister, you know that food will not satisfy you. The pleasure that you think that you will find as you determine to go after that sin will only bring you pain in the end. You know it's true. Repent and come back. This is your identity as a son of God. There's only two fathers. Who's your father? Your relationship with sin reveals whether or not you know the truth. The Jews did not know the truth. They did not understand they were born slaves of sin. They did not get that they needed rescue. They said, we have never been enslaved to anyone. The freedom they needed, they didn't even realize they needed. True freedom only comes through Jesus. How do, how do we receive this freedom? First, continuing in his word. This is the word of life. This is what I need to be sustained. This is how I need to live so that I can stay alive. And through knowing the truth, knowing the truth of my creation. I was created to be a worshiper and I can be set free to worship through Jesus Christ alone. Knowing the truth of my sonship, I was born a son of Satan and I was rescued and delivered into the kingdom of light. And last, in John 8, through accepting his rescue, whom the son sets free, he is free indeed. Uh, let me describe it this way, if you will. Imagine that you're in a dungeon. You are held captive against your will. And one day a rescuer comes and he throws that door open and he comes into that prison cell to deliver you. What do you do? Well, what many do is they say, I like it here. I'm comfortable. I don't need rescue. I like these bars. I like being a slave. I like having no rights. I want to stay here. I like having Satan as my father and my master. I like doing his bidding and his will. Or there are those who say, Lord, thank you. Please rescue 
me. And they allow him to take them up in his arms and deliver them from that kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. All who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. And so if I've, as I've been speaking today, you're sensing that you are a slave of sin still, that you have not been set free, it's available. The prison door is open and the rescuer is standing there and he's ready to deliver you. Cry out to Jesus and he will rescue you. You look at the passage, John 8, 34. Jesus responded, Truly I tell you, everyone who commits sin is a slave of sin. A slave does not remain in the household forever, but a son does remain forever. So if the son sets you free, you really will be free. There's only one who has the right to set you free, and that is the son and the son alone. And the way he does it, is by purchasing your soul so you can be adopted into his family. The only way for you to be rescued is through adoption. It's through joining through Jesus to the Father as your eternal head. This is what you need to be rescued from slavery to sin. Only Jesus offers it, and he offers it freely. I told you there's two dangers. One danger is believing that I don't need rescue, that I like it in my prison cell, that I don't need any help. The other danger is believing that Jesus is just not strong enough. And I want you to know that you and I both have believed this many times in our life. Perhaps even daily we believe this. We believe that Jesus is not strong enough every time we come to that point where desire has conceived and it gives birth to sin. Every single time we come to that moment where we feel in ourselves that this temptation is just too much, I cannot resist it, I must give in to it. What you have forgotten is that you are joined to a vine that provides you everything that you need for life and godliness. What you have forgotten is that the one who set you free has set you free indeed. And so when you feel like sin is rearing its ugly head and demanding your allegiance and your obedience, understand you serve a new master who has rescued you from that slavery and delivered you into his kingdom. And through him and through him alone, you can say no. When you follow Jesus, you are always led in victory when you follow him. So then why do I sin every day? Because I stop following. Because I see where he's going and the spirit is convicting me and I say no and I turn and I go the other way. But when I follow him, I'm always led in victory. How, how do we live out that freedom in its fullness? A couple passages I want to point out to you to help you understand how to receive this rescue. The first one is in Psalm 119, verse 133. Psalm 119, 133 says this, Make my steps steady through your promise. Don't let any sin dominate me. How do we receive rescue? Through promises and through power. Through promises and through power. What do I mean? Look at the first sentence there. What is it? that rescues us. He says, make my steps steady through your promise. The reason that we're able to be led in victory is because God's word reveals the path of life to me. Jesus says, follow me. Step here, step here, step here. And if you step where he tells you, you know what? You will not be shaken. You will not fall. You will always be led in victory. But how do you know where Jesus is telling you to step? How do you know where those stepping stones of freedom are located? You read this. You spend time in this. And guess what it's full of? Precious promises. And through these precious and very great promises, you are a partaker of the divine nature. 
as you in dependence upon the Holy Spirit step into that promise that he's told you, this is how you're supposed to live. This is what you're supposed to do. Trust me. The world says maybe this is foolish. The world says, no, you shouldn't live that way. It's not going to bring you lasting joy. But God's word says, yes, that is the path. That's how I'm going to walk. That's what I'm going to do. That's how I'm going to live. Even if everything that surrounds me says it's a lie, if God's word says it's true, I'm going to obey it. And I'm never going to go beyond that. That's the stepping stone. That's what's revealed in God's word. I'm not going to step on the side or the right or the left. Neither one. His word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. It illuminates my way and I know where to walk. So why do I fall? Because I step off into the darkness. Because I say, well, you know, this is what God's word reveals is absolutely true. But, you know, psychology says... This really wouldn't be, you know, good for me if I did exactly what God's word says. So I'm going to just sort of change it a little bit. That's where devastation comes in. That's where destruction happens. When I begin to exalt the voice of man over the voice of God, and when I decide the stepping stones should be determined more by the dictates of my heart than by God's word, through promise and through power. Do you see the second part of that? Let not any sin dominate me. Do you know Jesus can do that? Do you believe that Jesus can do that? Do you live like Jesus can do that? What about in that moment where you're wrestling? What about in that moment when you're being tempted? Do you believe that what the psalmist says right here can be true in your life in that moment? You know, one of the reasons that we lose battles is because we try to fight them all at once. Because we realize that on this side of eternity, we're never going to reach perfection. We throw up our arms in resignation and we say, well, I'll never be perfect, so I might as well sin now. Fight the battle you're in. And in that battle, instead of thinking about the fact that daily you will fall, daily you will fail, don't think about that. Fight the battle you're in. And in that battle, pray this, let not sin dominate me. Right here in this moment, right now, I need rescue. And believe this, whom the Son sets free is free indeed. And he always leads you in victory. That's what faith looks like. That's what living in faith looks like. Trusting what he has said is true about you. But how, how can we live this life? We're mortal flesh. We're fallen humanity. You need to be reborn. And you're reborn with life from above. 2 Corinthians 3.17 says this, Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. You're free. Why? Because the Holy Spirit has taken up residence within you. Understand this. You cannot walk on those stepping stone promises of God apart from the strength the Holy Spirit supplies. Sin will dominate you if the Holy Spirit doesn't animate you. You need Him. You need His sustaining life inside of you. And when He's inside of you, guess what? You're free. Sin does not rule over you. Sin is not your master. He gives you the strength. He trains your hands for war. He equips you with what you need to have victory in that moment. The passage goes on. He says this, We all with unveiled faces are looking as in a mirror at the glory of the Lord and are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory. This is from the Lord who is the Spirit. What's the ministry of the Holy Spirit inside of me? Transformation. Do you see that? We're being transformed transformed. This is from the Lord who is the Spirit. Gospel transformation in my life is the work of the Holy Spirit. And I want you to understand this. What the writer of first, what Paul is doing here in first Corinthians, second Corinthians chapter three, is he's juxtaposing the glory of the old covenant with the new. And under the old covenant, Moses would go into God's presence and he would have that glory. And what would happen over time? It would fade. The glory that we have is an unfading glory. It's a growing glory. What do I mean? I mean, as you are sanctified, as you are set apart by the Holy Spirit, you come to look more and more and more and more like Jesus as life goes on. He's transforming you from glory 
to glory in an ever increasing degree, never going back. This is who you are. This is who you have been set free to become. And yeah, you're not perfect, but here's what you do. You forget about what lies behind and you press on toward what lies ahead. Right now we're seeing in a mirror dimly. The perfect has not yet come, but one day it'll be face to face. And then I'll be like him because I'll see him like he is. Perfection doesn't come until I behold the face of my Lord. But in the meantime, I am being transformed from glory to glory. By increasing degrees, I'm looking more and more like him every day. What Jesus gives cannot be taken by any political entity. It cannot be granted by anything in all of sinful humanity. It can only be realized through Jesus Christ alone. If, if you spend any amount of time with me, or if you pay attention to the way I preach, you'll realize I love allegories. I, I love stories that are really good allegories. My favorite allegory ever written is Pilgrim's Progress. And, and if you're familiar with that story, what I love about it is how thick the allegory is. It, it applies to just the entire Christian life. A lot of allegories will just address one sort of component, one single component. It's like the whole thing. It's a, it's a buffet of Christianity in this story that you could just get a feast on. But I want to share with you today where that story came from. That, that story was written by a man named John Bunyan. And John Bunyan lived in the 17th century. He was a very sinful man. And he was transformed through the gospel. He, had, uh, he was married. He had four children. And actually, sort of through his, his wife's own testimony, he got saved. And when he got saved, he was on fire. He wanted to share the gospel with everybody. And soon he was being asked to preach. But there was a problem. In England at this time, you could not preach unless you had a special preaching license. And to get the preaching license, you had to agree with certain doctrines that John Bunyan didn't agree with. So he kept on preaching. And so he was arrested. One year before, two years before he was arrested, his wife died. Four children were left to him, one of them blind. One year before he was arrested, he remarried a young lady, 18 years old. When he was arrested, he had a brand new bride of one year, four children, one of whom was bl blind, and his wife was pregnant with her fifth. He was in prison for 12 years. That, that child that his wife was pregnant with was stillborn, most likely because of the, the rigors of trying to scrape by an existence without somebody to provide for them. Can you imagine what it would be like to be locked in a prison cell and to know that your wife and your children are outside suffering without you? Can you imagine the longing you would have to be free and to be able to be with them again? Now imagine this. Imagine the magistrate comes to you and says, hey, you just have to agree not to preach anymore and we'll let you go. And every three months they come and they tell you this. And for 12 years you say, I can't agree to that. Imagine the turmoil, the struggle. As they say, don't you love your wife? You can, you can go. You can go be with your wife. You can go be with your kids. Come on. You're missing everything while you're here in prison. All you have to do is agree to give up the freedom to preach the word. And you can be free. See, John Bunyan recognized that wasn't freedom. And what he realized that while he was chained, he was free. It was during those 12 years that he wrote Pilgrim's Progress. While he was locked in that prison cell, and while he was there, he never stopped preaching. He shared with everybody who came into contact with him. He ministered to many pastors who were arrested along with him. He led many to the Lord. Why? Because the gospel cannot be chained. One of, one of my favorite quotes from him during this time was that I preach deliverance to others. I tell them there is freedom while I hear my own chains clang. He recognized I'm chained, but the gospel isn't. 
the deliverance that I preach is available to all. And it's experienced today. Right now, in this moment, there are people in deep, dark prison cells all over the face of this earth who are absolutely, perfectly free. Because true freedom comes from Christ alone. And the freedom that you need is freedom from slavery to the ruler of this world, to sin and death, and it's available to all who will call upon the name of the Lord, all who will receive that freedom. He's offering it to you. Have you received that? Have you accepted his rescue? If you haven't, I want to ask you today to make that decision to accept the rescue that Jesus is offering. Do you believe on the one hand that you don't need to be set free? I hope that today you recognize you do need rescue. Or maybe perhaps you've been living in slavery to some sort of sin. I don't know what it is, and I don't need to know. The Holy Spirit is the one who convicts you of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. And the good news that I have for you today is that deliverance is available to you. Or, or maybe you've given your life to Christ, but you've never really understood the glorious liberty that you have as a liberated humanity who is no longer a slave of sin. The freedom that you need is the freedom that you have in Christ Jesus. Let's thank him for it. Lord, we thank you that we can be free indeed. Help us, Lord, to faithfully entrust ourselves to you, to depend upon you for rescue, rescue from temptation, rescue from anything in this life that tries to hold us captive. Help us, Lord, to not believe the lie that doing things contrary to your word would be better, but help us to realize living in conformity to Scripture is life, eternal life. Help us, Lord, to continue in your word. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.